and welcome to another edition of the Health Research Report this 25th of January 2013. I apologize for the unusual lighting. It gives me this kind of Vincent Price effect, shadowy type horror story type thing. All right, then we have four articles. Maybe that's what the lighting's for, because the articles are. Yeah. All right, four articles. Antibacterial agent used in common soaps found in increased amounts of freshwater lakes. Sounds boring, but it's actually interesting. Two, cancer experts are to remain to be convinced by breast screening review. All right. Ah, stop using the word all right. Next, are antidepressants overused? The title kind of lead to what you may think it does. And number four, Humans are a plague on the earth. Yeah, that's really um, kind of cool. All right, let's start by not using the word all right so much. Next, antibacterial agent used in common soaps found in increased amounts of freshwater lakes. Let's back it up a little bit. Let's say you're bathing your new infant baby. Would you bathe your child in, or someone else's child, in a bathtub, let's say, full of dioxins? Would you? You know, dioxins being the poison, little skull and crossbone stuff you see all over the place, and, you know, nerve agents, PCBs, the whole lineup. Would you do it? Well, you are if you use an antibacterial soap that contains triclosan. So let's back it up. Environmental Scientific Technology published online. This is what they came out with. Triclosan, when mixed in with chlorinated compounds and add a little bit of sunlight, form dioxin. Yay! Of course, they got us scared to death about bacteria, just enough to go wash our hands with poison, or face, or children, or whatever, a whole body. Yes, this is the same triclosan which causes bizarre muscle weakness. And also found linked to cancers, especially prostate cancers. Of course, triclosan, where do you find it? Uh, toothpaste, dishwashing soap, hand soap, cosmetics, clothing. They embed it in antibacterial, whatever you do, a cooking board stuff that you chop food up on. And also in toothpaste, as I said before, but it's in the toothpaste to help you fight gingivitis. Of course you're going to fight gingivitis. If you kill everything off with poison, you don't have to worry about gingivitis. You just have to worry about worrying where you're going to live or how you're going to live because you're being poisoned slowly by triclosan. This is what they said. In addition, the research found an increased amount of other chemical compounds called chlorinating triclosan derivatives. That form when triclosan is exposed to chlorine during the wastewater disinfection process. When exposed to sunlight, Triclosan and its chlorinated derivatives form dioxins that have potential toxic effects on the environment. Which is why they did it with fresh water. Obviously, toxic effects for the environment mean toxic effects for you. Wastewater treatment plants were not designed to take triclosan out. So even though they do eliminate a large majority of the triclosan, it still ends up in your water. So if you're avoiding, by some odd chance, antibacterial soap. You're still getting it, but more like in the form of docs and mixed in with uh, antibacterial soap. Drink that down next time you fill up a glass of water from the tap. Alright, cancer expert remains to be convinced by breast screening review. Now the debate goes on and on and on about breast screening and mammograms and the whole lineup. Obviously there's been some corruption in regards to the breast screening thing we know about. And back and forth, people just become propagandized into believing that they need breast cancer screening. All right, well, in November, they did it. Uh, they came out with a report. They looked at old data, and the old data, which helped install what's called experimented bias, because they don't want to use new data, because they use old data. Because they realize that if you use new data, the results aren't going to come out the way you want them to. So, the old data back in November said breast cancer screenings prevent 43 deaths for every 10,000 women diagnosed. And of course, out of the 681 diagnoses, 129 people 
are going to be treated with cancer, which would never have killed them in their lifetime to begin with. Oh, most people don't realize that. You can still have cancer, but it just grows so slowly. If it grows at all, if your body doesn't take care of it on its own, but you'll still be treated for it. However, using modern observational data, the cancer researchers came up with a totally different perspective. They found out that the chance of overdiagnosis from breast cancer, let's back this up. They looked at data from 10,000 women, and they found out that yes, three to four breast cancer deaths are avoided. But how many people die needlessly from overtreatment? Well, those figures they range said range from 2.72 to 9.25 deaths from the long-term toxicity of the treatment they never needed. Now, looking at the whole part, they come up to say the harms for breast cancer screening far outweigh the benefits of any lives saved. And then they looked at this. What are the chances of overdiagnosis using current data, observational data? Well, let's put it this way. Sydney, Australia just basically ran a study and found out the threshold for overdiagnosis or misdiagnosis before a person stops going to see breast screening, breast screening, breast cancer screening is about 30%. Now that seems like an extremely high number for big misdiagnosis. One in three. But yet you'd still go as a population. Now politically, they say it's only a 19% chance of misdiagnosis. But statistically, using modern data, the chance of misdiagnosis from breast screening the way it's done today in their words, with these data included, estimated rates of overdiagnosis as a result of screening increase up to 50%. So what's 50%? 50% is this. I take a coin, I flip it, 50% chance I got breast cancer, not I, or someone else, has breast cancer, it does not. So my machine and my diagnosis equipment are no better statistically than flipping a coin. Heads you got it, tails you don't. And you pay money for it on top of it. So next time you go to get a breast cancer screening, ask your doctor, medical professional, or technician, what are the odds of this giving me a misdiagnosis? But not only get a misdiagnosis, you get treated for the misdiagnosis, which means chemo and radiation. So that's the whole irony. You go bankrupt financially, you get treated for disease you never have, and then the chemo and the radiation start forming stem cells which can create cancer later on, which you never would have got, provided you didn't go to a stupid uh, breast cancer screening appointment. Think about that. Science is about data, not about propaganda. We're not dealing with lucky rabbit's foots here. And the thing about this, we're using mammographies, which have been around since what, 1950? And you see all this money being spent on health care expenditures? No, come on, guys. Do a better job. But they're not going to do a better job until you, as an individual, demand better job, a better job. It's called capitalism, not communism. All right. Capitalism meaning free market economy. That basically, that things tend to improve as there's competition in the marketplace. You get better and better stuff out there. Out here, no competition. Everyone's buying a mammogram. A mammography, it's called communism. Like those one pair of shoes you see in the windows in the old Soviet Union we used to make fun of? Well, once you try MRIs or sonograms or something, stop buying the same stupid stuff. All right, after that, enough to depress you. Are antidepressants overused? Now, in Britain, they noticed the last year in 2011, they had a, what, a 9.6% increase in antidepressant use. But, how would you have such an incredibly high over, I mean, prescription increase in uh, antidepressants besides having a bad economy? Well, guess what the diagnosis for depression is? What do you think? Some sort of bad heart palpitations, anxiety, high blood pressure going up, jitters, you know, the type of shock thing, bereavement? No. Two weeks 
of low mood. Two weeks of low mood qualifies you for a depression diagnosis. Now, albeit, even states in here, that 75% of those people who write the definition for what depression is have links to the drug companies. Meaning, the more depressed people there are, the more money they make. The more they can convince you you're depressed, the more money they make. Meaning, not necessarily getting you psychological help, a little bit of therapy, something to talk your problems through. No, it's basically here. You go into the office, you walk in, you get this bottle of tablets that's supposed to make you feel good. You know, kind of like a corner drug dealer, but without the office in the white coat. So, think about that. And they said, even in the best case scenario, they said, do the Cochrane review suggest that one in seven people actually benefit? And that's the best case scenario. One in seven. That's even far suckier than the breast cancer diagnosis thing. But yet, you're buying it. Not you necessarily, but someone that's a you that's also listening, or someone knows you that's buying it. And on top of that, you get to have six months if you are diagnosed of not having depression by some odd chance. Six months of unnecessary medical treatment, which is going to result in a ton of other side effects. You know, light hurts, hangover type feeling, lack of sensation. You know it. But that's if you're lucky enough to have a really good medical provider who is willing to take you off that medication because it's not working. Or you're not suffering from placebo effect that makes you think the medication is working. So once you're on it, whether you're depressed or not because you're two weeks of low mood, which makes every adolescent in the frickin' planet clinically depressed, you may be on it for the rest of your life. You never needed it. But yet, to the bright side, is you've been making some of these guys a lot of money. And who are these guys? The same guys who come up with the headline, Humans are a plague on the earth that need to be controlled by limiting population growth. Obviously, this was in an article just recently by Sir David Edinburgh. Now, wouldn't it be so bad, but you think about it, this guy's a member of the Royal Society, one of the best scientists out there. Then you had Sir Nurse, or whatever the guy was, they got all the billionaires together to talk about population control. Even though as the billionaires ate their donuts, Twinkies, and Ding Dongs, or whatever billionaires do, because they don't look exactly the healthiest group out there. But, however, they say the population needs to have its growth limited, which can be be true, but however, though, they want it on a voluntary basis. Now, the quick trick is this. When someone says we need to limit population growth voluntarily, who voluntarily? The you voluntarily? Hey, you. Limit your population growth. Governments voluntarily? Hey, you people. Stop having kids. Or some sort of weird plutocracy by some odd chance. Hey, billionaires, let's get together. Let's find a way to put things in the environment that are going to sterilize people one way or the other without them knowing it. BPA, PVCs, a few other medications here and there. Now, what the heck? You know, obviously that has nothing to do with sperm counts dropping so rapidly in the recent period of time. But that's what you got to think about. And also, too... Why are these people, whoever these people are, billionaires and everything else like that, using the word plague and humans in the same terminology? So when you have individuals using the word plague and human, and these are the same people that have controlled your health care, these are the same people that control your food supply, these are the same people that produce goods and services in direct research, because money is where the power comes from, you have to be really get into the psychology of it. I've heard about controlling population. I've heard about concerns about overpopulation. But I never started hearing the words plague and human being synonymous with each other. So how do you normally get rid of plagues? You obviously have to cure it. But what do you do to the bacteria and viruses that cause the plagues? I'm not going to use the word. Use the word. And that's it. This issue... On the 25th of January 2013, another edition of Health Research Report. And of course, all being, be back next week. 
And I always appreciate you guys listening. And uh, we'll take it later on. Catch you in a bit. Bye.